Journal. Let's hear it for Cooper. Thank you. So in addition to this being the week before the Jaipur Literary Festival, if you've been on Facebook lately, you may have noticed that this is National Suicide Prevention Week. And thinking on that brought this story to mind. So I asked the question, does anybody actually remember Live Journal? And I'm seeing a couple. Does anybody still post? You don't? Good. Live Journal, if you are not familiar, was the cool, hip social media before MySpace was cool, hip social media, and MySpace was the cool, hip social media before Facebook. And if I have to explain Facebook, I'm not. So, in the early 2000s, 2004, Live Journal did, in fact, save my life. It was a sort of personal blogging site. You could, you could write your little blog, you had friends, you could dictate who saw what, you had interests, you could click on, see who else was interested in live storytelling, yeah, join a group, very rudimentary. But in 2004, this was cool shit. Now, I was a sophomore at a prestigious Eastern Liberal Arts College. I was taking somewhere on the equivalent of 18 credit hours plus working two theater shows. I was literally and figuratively out of my mind. I had spent all of my high school years at an intense academic school here in Colorado. Um, academia was what I did. It's what I thought my parents wanted me to do, what, how I was supposed to succeed. And at 19, I had no clue who I was. I didn't know who Cooper was. I didn't know what I wanted. But I thought that the more that I worked at academics, the more it would make sense. I could make my parents happy. Things would eventually work themselves out. This led to me not only having very intense depression, but building a couple of rules for myself. And these are, in retrospect, were probably very bad rules. These rules included that I was not allowed to sleep unless I had passed 48 hours of wakefulness. Within these rules were the fact that I was allowed to eat for seven minutes a day. I can get in and out of a dining hall in 10 minutes, having consumed 2,000 calories to this day. Also, one of my coping mechanisms was cutting. I've had an addiction to razor blades for a fair portion of my life, and it was that year when I was 19 that it really came to a head. I'd started cutting when I was 13, and it makes no sense from the outside, but having this well of darkness and depression and unknowingness inside me, taking a razor blade to my arm or my chest let me make pain real. It let me control it. It let me be in charge for once. And in this miasm of darkness and blackness, I, I was falling. I was never truly, I think, suicidal, but in the words of the Dread Pirate Roberts, there was that conversation every night. Good night, Cooper. Good work. Sleep well. I might kill you in the morning. And every morning I had that conversation with myself about why I wasn't suicidal. And in this strange time and place, I found LiveJournal. I found this strange social media group, um, people with names like Morphine and Clockwork Fairy and Ben Kenobi, people who I found out later I had lived 10 miles away from in Colorado, but I would never see face to face. I would never see pictures of their faces, though I saw the picture of the ruin they left on their bodies with knives. It was the kind of place where I held long conversations late into the night over instant messenger about depression, about what I was going through, and I found people who seemed to be going through the same things. I have waxed philosophical late into the night about the difference between a razor blade and a corkscrew when I tear apart my chest. And in this strange place, there were these moments still where discussing how we might destroy ourselves, we were desperately trying to keep one another alive. There was a young girl, maybe 14 years old, who talked about how she would rub acetone, uh, nail polish remover, into her cuts. And we jumped on this, please begging her, use rubbing alcohol. It will burn less, but you won't have cancer in 20 years. This was this community. It was strange and tight-knit, and in some desperate way, we were trying to keep each other alive. We, I might have these moments when someone from the outside, someone with an agenda, would come in and preach to us about how suicide was wrong. Think of your friends, think of your family. And at this point, we could barely think about ourselves. But in that place, in that strange, anonymous place deep in the internet, we found someone else who might care about us. We found someone else who we could talk to. And when salvation was so far away, we couldn't even consider it. It was that digital hand of a stranger that we could hold as we walked through hell that in the end got me through.